In this talk, we will discuss focal echogenic lesions seen in cranial sonography in an effort to expand the differential diagnosis of these lesions beyond the simple hemorrhage. These seven infants, each of whom have a focal echogenic lesion, they look quite similar. However, all of each of them has a different diagnosis that we will summarize at the end of the talk. The differential diagnosis of these lesions includes, in addition to hemorrhage, focal neuronal ischemia or stroke, both primary and secondary calcifications, gliosis, hypermyelinization, melanosis, and fat. Although they can have a very similar appearance, one can usually narrow the differential diagnosis somewhat by knowing the gestational age, how old the child is post-gestationally, knowing both the history and type of hypoxemia or asphyxia, and the presence of associated anomalies. These three infants show the typical pattern of premature hemorrhage, extending on the left side from germinal matrix through intraventricular in the center and intraparenchymal peripherally on the right side. These hemorrhages are typically brightly echogenic initially and gradually become liquefied and less echogenic over time. However, hemorrhages in term and near-term infants are often different in location and cause and appearance. Here are two near-term infants with a clotting abnormality. The infant on the left side has a brightly echogenic thalamic hemorrhage. The infant on the right has post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus and a moderately echogenic clot in the parietal bone. Both infants were infants of mothers who had lupus and had platelet antibodies. In patients who have poorly clotted blood, the blood can range in echogenicity from the typical brightly echogenic blood to lucent blood, and often the blood will have an echogenicity similar to surrounding brain, so the extent of the hemorrhage may be difficult to assess initially because there is very poor distinction between blood and underlying brain. This is particularly the case in infants who are treated with ECMO where there is a coagulopathy that is quite common during this time. In another child who is near-term with critical coarctation of the aorta, we see a flame-shaped hypertensive hemorrhage in the deep white matter. Now, this patient has had diffuse hypoxic ischemic injury, is full-term, and we can see these focal bright bands of increased echogenicity surrounding the, the gyri in the central portions of the brain. These represent secondary hemorrhages in the subcortical U fibers. And so secondary hemorrhage can be seen as um, brightly echogenic lesions that occur not as a result of a clotting abnormality, but as a result of underlying abnormal brain. And then here we have a child who is approximately 30 weeks who has symmetric bilateral basal ganglia, echogenic lesions that are moderately bright, but rather than unlike hemorrhages, they do not exhibit a mass effect, they do not displace normal structures. And so in this situation, we need to include uh, focal neuronal ischemia. At uh, pathology, this child had um, focal neuronal injury in the, the, um, the basal ganglia. This child has very similar echogenic lesions in both the putamina and globus pallidus, as seen on ultrasound and postmortem CT and MRI. This child was treated with ECMO for pulmonary hypertension, and at pathology we expected to see focal hemorrhages. 
However, on the gross specimen, there was no abnormality. Only during microscopic analysis did we see that these were related to microcalcifications. So microcalcifications can occur secondary to ischemia after one to several weeks post uh, insult and can result in diffuse and um, rather even focal echogenic lesions throughout the deep white matter. The other pattern of calcifications that we see is seen in this child who is 37 weeks and presents with seizures. You'll note in addition to the multiple coarse calcifications that are in the periventricular white matter, this infant has very limited sulcation despite being near term. This child had been infected with cytomegalovirus during pregnancy and these focal calcifications represent uh, secondary granuloma formation from the CMV infection. Here's another infant who has brightly echogenic symmetric lesions in the basal ganglia. This child is now four weeks post the hypoxic ischemic injury and these lesions gradually appeared over the last week. At autopsy, when this child died two days later, these areas represented focal gliosis. We do not generally see gliosis in premature infants, and this is a phenomenon that's only seen in term or near-term infants. Now, here is another child who is term, who had low APGAR scores following repeated compression of the cord uh, during labor. Now, three to four weeks post-birth, we now see these brightly echogenic, symmetric basal ganglia lesions without mass effect at all. At pathology, these were status marmoratus. This is an unusual condition. Uh, we've only seen two cases at our institution that were seen on ultrasound. They're seen more commonly in term than preterm infants and are seen in the situation of repeated episodes of brief ischemia, such as repeated cord compression. These um, lesions affect glutamate-bearing neurons uh, in areas that are very rich in these neurons, such as the basal ganglia. There is neuronal loss and secondary gliosis, but the most striking part of this is the hypermyelinization of the basal ganglia and capillary proliferation. This results in bright light bulb-like appearance to the basal ganglia, uh, typically there and in the thalamus. This infant was termed being treated with ECMO for pulmonary hypertension and developed a geographic pattern of increased echogenicity involving the distribution of the right middle cerebral artery here seen in the image to the left compared to the normal side on the, the right side of the screen. This is at day one. By day 11, we can see that there, this lesion has become very dense. There's loss of sulcal demarcation with a mass effect. And on CT, we can see that this was a middle cerebral artery stroke with secondary hemorrhage. Now, the size of the hemorrhage on CT is much smaller than the echogenic lesion on ultrasound. So it is very difficult for ultrasound to distinguish between hemorrhage and stroke or ischemia because they have a very common and very similar appearance. Focal stroke early on shows a pattern of diffuse geographic increased echogenicity with preservation of the gyral and sulcal pattern and diminished vascular pulsations on color Doppler. After two to three days in the next week or so, there's progressive increase in echogenicity with loss of the anatomic definition and the appearance of this peripheral luxury perfusion, very well shown on color Doppler. And late, after several weeks, now we see uh, 
atrophy, generalized or regional atrophy, and reduced cerebral blood flow. Focal stroke seems to be, um, has a distribution in the middle cerebral artery, almost exclusively. It is unilateral in um, the majority of cases and has an interesting predilection to the left side compared to the right. We see this in patients with polycythemia or hypercoagulable states, in patients who have embolized from other sources, patients who have been exposed to cocaine prenatally, um, patients who have had a vascular anomaly or generalized circulatory failure. Now, the other area or the other type of, of a focal echogenic lesion is commonly seen in patients who have other anomalies of the brain. And here we see this 39-week infant who is dysmorphic and has seizures. And what we see on the sagittal midline image is only a partially formed corpus callosum and these brightly echogenic lesions in the midline posterior to the genu of the corpus callosum. In this situation, these uh, brightly echogenic lesions represent colossal lipomas. In patients who have severe vasculitis or secondary or vasculitis secondary to meningitis, one can see focal areas of ischemia and stroke as shown in this patient who had Citrobacter cerebritis and extensive coagulative necrosis of the right frontal lobe. Over time, the brightly echogenic lesion seen in the upper right image gradually devolved into a liquefactive um, area of, uh, of anomaly. It is very difficult to tell the difference between an abscess and, and um, liquefied ischemic brain in these infants. Finally, we have another child who presented at six months of age with the, the clinical diagnosis of meningitis. And we see a very heterogeneous echogenic mass in the hem left hemisphere of the child. And initially, this was thought to be a hemorrhage. However, on color Doppler sonography, we can see that this echogenic lesion has hyperemia and flow within the lesion. So it cannot be a clot this child had a choroid plexus carcinoma. These are unusual, but at times difficult to separate between a clot and a, um, a tumor without color Doppler sonography. And finally, we have a child with a giant melanat melanocytic nevus in a bathing suit distribution. Uh, these infants may have congenital um, melanocytic uh, or neurocutaneous melanosis in between 2 and 45 percent of patients. If this is a neurocutaneous melanosis, they may develop melanocytic tumors in the leptomeninges. A small percentage of these infants will have the nevus degenerate into melanoma. And in this child, we have focal, multiple focal echogenic lesions throughout the posterior fossa and midbrain that were thought to be neurocutaneous melanosis. So we go back to the original seven infants that we saw where the lesions include germinal matrix hemorrhage, basal ganglia ischemia, neurocutaneous melanosis, a colossal lipoma. In the second row, we have gliosis. We have diffuse basal ganglia calcification secondary to ischemia. And finally, we have a choroid plexus papilloma or a carcinoma. I hope that this talk helped expand the differential diagnosis of echogenic lesions in cranial sonography.